We're carrying on our NHL offseason plan series, and today we look at the recently eliminated New York Islanders. What will we expect from the Isles this offseason? We'll discuss that coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. Now, as I mentioned, we're carrying on the offseason plan series today with the New York Islanders. Of course, they were a lower-ranked team, number 12 overall in the NHL, but we had to skip over them until their season was officially over uh, since they were still in the playoffs. So now that they're out of the playoffs, we're able to complete this video. We're almost near the end of the series. We still have the Colorado Avalanche, who are the top-ranked team in the NHL at the regular season level to do, and then, of course, the two teams in the Stanley Cup Finals. So three more to go. And this series will be complete. So first up, we're going to look at the Islanders' regular season stats. Then we're going to take a look at the contracts that are up for grabs to talk about any cap space that they have available to make things happen. And of course, take a look at the five burning questions facing the Islanders and Lou Lamarillo and company this offseason. So let's get started here and take a review of the Islanders' regular season statistics. Now, of course, as you can see, the Isles had a record of 32, 17, and 7 for 71 points. Uh, certainly had a pretty solid year, 12th overall. Uh, had a bit of a skid near the end of the year. Otherwise, could have had a chance to finish a little higher in the standings. They finished with a plus 28 goal differential, uh, which is pretty solid. But obviously, for a team that's so strong defensively, it goes to show that it's not quite as good as some of the other teams ahead of them due to their lack of ability to score at a higher level but sometimes it's hard to have teams built to be so strong defensively and offensively at the same time it's kind of a give and take here uh, when it comes to their special teams the power play wasn't the best it was 18.8 percent for 20th best in the nhl certainly something they can continue to work on and the pk was really solid again of course the defensive metrics are the were their strongest in 83.7 percent success rate for number six overall in the NHL. So, of course, no big surprise in that regard. Now, heading into the offseason here, the Islanders have uh, $5.7 million in salary cap space, which is not a lot. Now, they also have the possibility, because I don't know the status of uh, veteran forward Andrew Ladd, if he ends up possibly going on LTIR next season, which is a real possibility, then they could get some additional cap relief and uh, you know bump that number up if the ownership group continues to want to spend to the maximum that they're able to. Of course, we know they're opening a brand new arena next season, uh, and they're certainly going to want to put the best possible team on the ice and continue to build off the uh, semifinal uh, appearance that they just had, as well as the season before where they were in a similar predicament. I mean, they've had a couple of good playoff runs, but they just need to take some steps here to get over the hump to see if they can take it a step further. Now, let's take a look now at what contracts are expiring, what deals will they have to figure out with this limited amount of cap space that they have to work with. Now, as you can see, there's a decent amount of players here. And on the RFA side of things, we've got Anthony Beauvillier. Uh, hard to imagine he's been in the league five years now, but uh, coming to the end of his second contract, not too far away from UFA status, so certainly want to look after him. Uh, you've got uh, Michael Dalcole, uh, probably gets a short-term one-year deal, qualifying offer at most. Uh, you've got Adam Pellick, who's a huge part of their uh, top shutdown pair with him and Ryan Pollock. So I suspect Pellick will be uh, a, you know, a top order of business here. And we're going to discuss that in the next segment. And of course, you got goalie Ilya Sorokin coming off a pretty good rookie season. Uh, on the UFA side of things, you have rentals that were acquired at the deadline, including Kyle Palmieri and Travis Sajak. You've got longtime Islander forward Casey Sezikis. Uh, you got deadline acquisition Braden Coburn, who was picked up for insurance purposes. You have a longtime uh, veteran D, Andy Green, uh, who in his uh, postseason media availability did indicate he wants to continue playing and would like to stay with the Islanders. So that's, uh, you know, something we'll have to see. And then, of course, you had Corey Schneider, who was essentially signed to be that number three goaltender as well. Uh, again, a UFA with the Islanders. So now, with all that in mind, that's good not, as you can see, you know, under $6 million in cap space and all these players either be signed or replaced or what's going to happen here, something's got to give. It's going to be challenging. So what are the five burning questions facing the Islanders this offseason to get this team over the hump and can they actually get closer or win a Stanley Cup next year? Burning question number one is with that limited space, can they bring back all of their RFAs? We know the UFAs are quite possibly, not many of them coming back at least, but on the RFA side of things, a lot of these guys are younger players that are still important pieces, specifically Adam Pellick and secondary to, uh, Anthony Beauvillier. I mean, both those guys are important in some degree, and I don't really see the Islanders wanting to part ways. Now, of course, in his end of season media availability, Lou Lamarillo did indicate that the plan is to bring all the RFAs 
back. So clearly, uh, you know, there's a desire to do so, uh, and I think they can get something done. Uh, but obviously, I think you start with Adam Pellick, your first order of business this offseason. Ideally, if you can get that contract done before you get to free agency would be best. That way you know what you have in that regard. Uh, obviously, that's going to be around the same time. You probably see the trade season start to heat up before the like around the draft. So in the next few weeks, if they can get a pellet contract done, would be absolutely huge. That way they know what they're dealing with there. And that kind of solidifies the defense a little bit more. I mean, that pellet and pellet uh, combo is underrated to some degree around the league, but super important piece for the Islanders. So I think they can bring back all the RFAs. Del Cole's going to have to be a short one-year deal. Beauvillier probably doesn't get a long-term contract. I'm thinking probably like... Uh, you know, more than two years, though, because with Beauvillier, he's two years away from being a UFA. I would think they probably want to buy up at least one or two of his UFA years. So probably I'm thinking like a three to four year deal would probably be ideal for him. Uh, when it comes to Adam Pellick, he's only one year away from that. So you definitely want to get him ideally probably on a four or five year deal. I mean, maybe longer, but at least four to five years. Uh, he's a solid D back there who certainly earned that long term uh, stability and security to be with the franchise, in my opinion. So, yes, that's a top order of business. So, you know where you sit with the cap. And I think it can be done, but it's going to make things even tighter and it's going to result in some other moves needed to be made, which we'll discuss here in the next few questions. Number two is how do you handle the expansion drought? Because clearly, every team is going to lose a player out there. You want to minimize that, but at the same time, the teams that need cap relief sometimes really want them to take a different player that they may not want to take and you have to might have to make a side deal or kind of hope for the best here but in my opinion when it comes to the uh, the islanders in the expansion draft i know i've done a couple of mock drafts and i've kind of changed my mind as we've gone along of course as the season has progressed as certainly as players have you know kind of risen to the occasion in the playoffs it kind of changes your mind on who maybe should stay and who should be exposed for example goal settings pretty simple you protect varlamov because sorokin is exempt Pretty simple there. They have a, a you know a minor league goaltender like Ken Appleby who can qualify for the exposure metric. That so he he has enough experience to be exposed. You don't have to worry about that. Kraken can take him if they want. You don't really worry too much about it. On the blue line, though, you're going to end up likely exposing a veteran like Nick Letty. I don't really see any way around it. You're not going to want to expose Pulik or Pelic. And the way Scott Mayfield played in the playoffs, to me, you can't really risk losing him. He's got a really good contract, under $2 million bucks with a few years left on it. If Mayfield's exposed, he's more than likely the guy they take. And the way he played from a physical standpoint, scoring a huge goal in the Tampa series, you can't afford to let him go. So, But the way Letty's played... You know, it's not like he's played terrible, but to me, at five million bucks, you're not really getting a ton of value like you are out of these other guys, and you have to take a chance that Letty might be the guy to go. You need the cap space anyway. Maybe Lou tries to trade him ahead of the expansion draft. I don't know, but if I'm doing the protection here, I'm protecting Pollock, Pellick, and Mayfield, and exposing Nick Letty, and of course you also have Sebastian Ajo because you need to expose at least two defensemen, so that satisfies that in that regard. So that's what I would do. If from the forward group. Obviously, you're going to be protecting guys like Matthew Barzell, Brock Nelson, J.G. Pajot, uh, likely Josh Bailey. You get Captain Anders Lee in there. That's five. You likely get Anthony Beauvillier signed. And even if he's not signed yet, you protect him as well. So that's number six. And number seven is likely going to be either Clutterbuck or Martin. One's going to have to likely be exposed. So to me, is this Kraken going to want to take a guy like Nick Letty? Would they be more likely to take a veteran bottom six guy like Clutterbuck or Martin. So with either Martin or Clutterbuck being exposed, it's also going to expose Komarov and Jordan Eberle. To me, I don't protect Eberle in this scenario. Uh, to me, he's overpaid and not producing at the level he needs to, and you have to take a chance. Or you consider trading him because he's not the winger, and neither is Komarov that Matthew Brazell needs. So to me, like you have to put something out there that either Seattle's going to take or you try to make a trade because clearly... I don't see the Kraken taking Everly with the amount of term left on his deal. Maybe, but it's doubtful. So you can probably still keep him without losing him through expansion and end up trying to swing a trade or something. But they need to shake up that forward group to be more offensive. And Barzell needs some better players to play with. So to me, that's kind of how I handle the expansion draft process. So I'm not sure who you lose in that regard. Uh, but either way, if you can get Letty or Everly off the books through expansion... That might hurt a little bit with the fan base, but you know what? It's going to give you that necessary cap space you need to upgrade other areas of the team. 
Burning question number three is, can they and will they build in more youth to this franchise and this roster going forward? Barry Trotz really seems to favor the veteran guys, which to a degree I understand, but these young guys are never going to be able to get better and get the experience they need if you don't play them. So, you know, most importantly, I'm talking about Oliver Wallstrom, the most prominent young player who's not really getting a chance to play. He played very little in the playoffs. And to me, he's a guy you need to get in that lineup. He has to be a regular next year. Yeah, with Kiefer Bellows, he's another guy. Uh, you either play him regularly or trade him. To me, that's what you do because there's no point in wasting him away. I don't completely understand what it is they seem to be so hesitant with with Bellows, but if they're not content with him or happy that he can get the job done, then move on from him. You know, that's what you should do. But Wallstrom has to play. And based on Lou's end of season media availability, he did indicate that their intentions are to get more of the kids in the lineup more regularly next year, get to more regular roles. And they're also going to need that from a cap perspective. Like they're going to have to mix in some of these ELCs to offset some of the veteran guys that need to move on so they can create some cap space and see if they can make this team better moving forward. Burning question number four is, do they return with the same goaltending tandem? Now you got Varlamov and Sorokin. Sorokin needs a new deal. Verley doesn't have a lot of term left on his contract. And really from a performance standpoint, there's no reason not to come back with these guys. But from a cap perspective, you have to wonder, did they build up enough confidence in Sorokin that they would consider trying to sign him longer term and seeing if they can move Varlamov? Clearly, I think there would be interest. He doesn't have a ton of term on his contract, which is good. And secondly, he had an outstanding season. So why wouldn't teams be interested in acquiring a veteran net miner? I think there'd be enough teams out there looking for a change or help on goaltending that you could. Now, like I said, I'm not suggesting you trade Varlamov from a performance standpoint. Uh, I think having two goaltenders that are very capable like that and how they rotate it through the playoffs is rare and important. And maybe you don't mess with it, but as you're trying to figure out ways around the cap, if you're going to let Sorokin take the ball and run with it, this might be the year when you kind of have a little bit less you know, choice from a financial standpoint. Clearly, he's capable of being a starting goaltender. Do you do it now? Do you wait one more year? I don't know what you do. I mean, like I said, I understand why they went the route they did with their goaltending. They let Leonard and Grice move on. They brought in a Russian goalie to be the mentor to their younger Russian goalie, who's the future of the franchise. But Sorokin is not a spring chicken here. Like, he's already going to be 26 years old. So at this point, you know, how long do you wait before you make him the starter? And it's a good way to save some cap money, maybe get a good futures-based return. So I'm not pushing for a Verley trade or saying that they have to get rid of him. But it is another creative way you can look at to help other areas of the team. Because we, we know this team needs to be more offensively gifted. They need another type of scorer who can play in their top six. And you're going to have to find a way from a cap perspective to make that happen. Moving guys like Eberly or Letty might not actually happen because it might prove to be too difficult. If it's too difficult, you might have to move something of more value. It's just that simple. So as much as you might not want to, when are you ready to let Sorokin run with the ball? And it could be a possibility that Lou might explore this offseason. The last burning question is, with all that in mind, with the salary cap constraints that they're dealing with, with the potential moves we just talked about, can they find a game-breaking type of winger to play with Matthew Barzell? He cannot go into next year playing with Jordan Eberle and Leo Komarov. To me, that line is just not nearly as successful as it needs to be. I understand why Trotz likes Komarov with Barzell in a sense because he can play that heavy style of game, uh, be a little bit more responsible defensively, but he needs a game-breaking type of winger. He can't do it all himself. Like you see a lot of times when they're down a goal and they're struggling to get back in a game and he's pushing hard, he's extremely creative, and sometimes he has to be a little more selfish, which is something he should work on too, uh, and, and shoot more. That's a Barzell you know, a, a area that he needs to get better at because he doesn't always have the help around him to get it done. I don't have a ton of confidence in Jordan Eberle with how he's played. Eberle was a junior legend. I had a lot of confidence in him. I was a huge fan of his working his way to the NHL, but he's really underwhelmed, especially in the past few years. Uh, so to me, he's a good player. He's just not good enough to be your top line winger. It's just that simple. So a contract has to go, whether it's Eberle, Nick Letty, Leo Komarov, like something has to give here to get Barzell some true help. I mean, they were close to getting Panarin in free agency before he went to the Rangers. That would have been a huge help. Uh, they had been rumored to be in the Patrick Line sweepstakes. I don't know how close they ever got or, how, or really how involved they were, but they were speculated to be like they need that type of player so i mean you can have 
two or three really good defensive lines, but you have to have one line you can rely on offensively. And guys like Nelson and Bailey, Bovillier, they're all good players. They're good middle six guys who can get the job done and be responsible at both ends of the ice. Uh, like, like I really like what Bailey and Nelson have brought that consistency. But they just they need one more piece. Anders Lee is not it. He's not the 40 goal scorer he was back before he signed his long term deal. Uh, good player, good captain, good leader. Lots of good things to say about him. But still, he's not that piece. They need one more beyond that. It's not Kyle Palmieri. I really don't know who it is. I just they just need a dynamic winger to play with Barzell. Plain and simple. It's going to be tough to do. Maybe it's Oliver Wallstrom. Maybe that's the end of the day. It turns out to be him because it's going to prove to be difficult cap-wise. And like I said, some of these pieces are easy to say what needs to go. It's a lot tougher to make that happen. So we'll have to wait and see what Lou does, what kind of magic he can work, and see if he can go for a three-peat here of GM of the year and get this team a little closer, if not winning a Stanley Cup in 2022. So let me know your thoughts on what to expect from the Isles this offseason down in the comments and we'll discuss further. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with all the latest news and rumors on all 32 NHL teams. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you next time.